Hello and welcome to CIPR TV, live at five. You know how much I like saying that. I'm Philip Sheldrake and this is my co-host Stephen Waddington. Hello. And we have a fascinating live programme ahead of us today. The best part of 20 minutes on the subject of public affairs and lobbying and imminent changes to the governance of lobbying. Remember, we do this show live for a reason, so that you can join in wherever you find yourself right now. You can use the form at the bottom of the player or tweet away with the hashtag hash CIPR TV. And I learned this week that participation, rather than simply tuning in, of course, earns you five CPD points. <laughs> but before we go on, a quick thank you to everyone who took the time to complete the CIPR TV survey during the past few weeks. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account, but I think we were able to reach three pretty clear conclusions. Firstly, you like what we're doing, particularly it being a live show. It creates a good buzz. Secondly, it's about the best time of the week for your involvement. And thirdly, apparently we couldn't have picked better looking hosts. Well, I can categorically agree with all those I'm three I'm conclusions. I'm going to deny that. Uh, now we're joined by not one, but two esteemed guests today. Elizabeth France is a member of the British Transport Police Authority, Chair of the Office for Legal Complaints, Vice President of Aberystwyth University, a member of the General Assembly of Manchester University, and previously Chief Ombudsman and Chief Executive of the Ombudsman Service, non-executive director of the Serious Organised Crime Agency, the Data Protection Registrar and Information Commissioner. She received a CBE for services to data protection and Elizabeth joins us today as Chair of the UK Public Affairs Council. Serving alongside Elizabeth on the Public Affairs Council or UK PAC as it's known is Keith Johnson. Keith's Director of Policy and Communications at the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners and he focuses on international lobbying involving such bodies as the OECD, the EU, and the UK and US governments. Elizabeth, Keith, thanks so much for joining us today. Perhaps, Keith, we could start with you with a definition before we start of what lobbying is. Yeah, definition of lobbying. I'm going to read that. Uh, Are you pre-prepared? I'm pre-prepared. It's, uh, it's on the UK PAC website, uh, but since it's a definition, I'll, I'll read it out to get it absolutely right. It says, uh, lobbying in UK PAC terms, and this is our definition, means in a professional capacity, attempting to influence or advising those who wish to influence the UK government, parliament, devolved legislators or administrations, regional or local government or other public bodies on any matters within their competence. So I'd just like to emphasise there that it's in a professional capacity, so we're looking at paid lobbyists, and that also means lobbyists that do the work for a significant element of, a, of their job. So in, U, in CIPR terms, that means 20% of your job or more. Wow. Thank you very much for that. It just sets the show up nicely. Otherwise, we could have 20 minutes. We we're wondering whether we're using the same definition. Absolutely. Well, so, Elizabeth, can you describe how we've got to where we have with the well, UK Public Affairs Council? It's been quite a long journey. I think that there have been various times and occasions where lobbyists, or perhaps we ought to say public affairs professionals, because you know lobbyists seems to, in some people's views, narrow it too much and have certain connotations we might not necessarily want to share. So part of the definition, as Keith was describing, focuses on the activity, not the label. So it's what we're doing that's important. But So it started obviously with various um, events which reach the headlines and then ministers get concerned, professionals get concerned because of the reputation of the profession. And so there have been various opportunities oh, you always turn a threat into an opportunity, to move towards something which showed that the profession takes its ethical standards seriously and wants to demonstrate that it can self-regulate effectively. And there was a report of the Public Administration Select Committee, it was in 2009 that they reported, saying that they thought there should be statutory regulation of lobbyists. Um, the response uh, from the profession and indeed the response from the then government was that self-regulation should be given a chance. And Sir Philip Moore uh, was appointed to set up an implementation group and to work with the industry to see what they could do and whether they could achieve amongst themselves something which would persuade people that this could be done as effective self-regulation. And UKPAC was launched as a not-for-profit company in July this year. The 1st mm -hmm. of July we count as our starting date. Uh, yes, 2010, that's right, sorry, beg your pardon, uh, last year. Um, and I was appointed as chair, and there are two other independents, and I think that's the important thing. So the, the directors are drawn from the three bodies who've made up UKPAC, but in addition there are three independent directors. 
the three bodies that so the three bodies that make up the organization the APPC the PRCA and the CIPR that's right CIPR members how, how do we, what's our responsibility to the organisation? Well, at the moment, the most important responsibility is that they sign up to the UK uh, PAC register. Uh, we've said to people we recommend that they sign up by the end of this month, so 31st of January, uh, because we're going live uh, to the public and to journalists in early February. So if you meet that definition of a, of a lobbyist and you're a member of CIPR, go to the website and register. We, well, that's, um, we actually have some questions coming straight Ooh. in already from Twitter. Firstly, we have one from Phil from Whitney Ponchak. How much does this how much does this regulation affect the relationship between lobbyists and corporations? Will they be considered more like solicitors, for example? Is that the right I think, parallel? I think the first thing I want to say before Keith chip, chips in is that it's not regulation. We're not, not regula we are not a regulator. UK PAC is not a regulator. We're assisting self-regulation, and that's rather different. So what we're trying to do is raise the profile of, of what the ethical standards should be. And the register is about transparency. So at the moment, at this stage, and we haven't talked about what the present government might want to do, that might come mm. up in a minute. But at the moment, this is about the industry getting its own house in order, and it really shouldn't affect relationships. I mean, It shouldn't affect relationships with employers at all. I mean, if anything, it will increase the credibility of public affairs practitioners that they are seen to be regulated and seen to be ethical. I should just clarify that actually question was from a Whitney Punchak as an organisation. So uh, self-governance uh, naturally implies enforcement. What, what did members self-regulate, they sign up yeah, to the, 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 the CIPR the, is the regulator in this case. The UK PEC will, will oversee the three regulatory bodies who are all members, make sure they're doing a good job, make sure they're acting in the, in the public interest. And, and the CIPR will regulate its members. We have, a, we have a code of conduct, we have guidelines, we have a disciplinary panel to, to look into and investigate any wrongdoing. And what we've agreed is a set of guiding principles that go over the three codes, of, uh, uh, the codes that exist for the three bodies. We've got some guiding principles that everybody's signed up to. And also one of the remits of UK PAC is to go in and check that these are actually being used and are actually working. So we'll be setting up a sort of call it a light touch audit if mm. you like, we'll be setting up something so that UK PAC goes in and says, how many complaints have you had? How have they been handled for the future? This isn't going backwards, this is for the future. Uh, and checking that the rules work, that the panels exist as they say. In other words, checking that what it says on the tin is actually what's in there. And a quick a clarification from Laurie Seacrest, UK. So we're talking England, Scotland, Wales. We are. Uh, is the UK Northern Ireland? Well, yes, yes Any, it is. anything that's. Uh, I always forget the difference between Britain and the UK. We're, we're talking about UK. Um, we don't know when we get on to talking about the extension to a statutory scheme um, whether that will go beyond England. Okay. But in terms of the self regulation, the voluntary scheme, we're covering the whole of the UK. So, so let's come on to that. The government's been fairly vocal about uh, the governance of, of lobbying. What's your relationship with the current government? Well, the first thing um, that I did when I took up post was during the overlap period to go with Sir Philip Moore to see Mark Harper, who's taking responsibility for this within the Cabinet Office. Uh, and we had a useful talk with him. And the most important thing there was that um, he promised that his officials would keep in touch with us as we developed and as they developed their thinking. Now, that's where we are at the moment because no consultation's mm. yet been issued and we wait to see that and By then the to respond to that. Mm. So the government are planning to issue fairly open questions, we understand, in a consultation paper, which we would expect to see in the next month or so. And that will then be there'll be a period of the usual period of 90 days for people to respond to that and then they'll turn that into proposals for legislation and the one date they have made public is that they expect legislation to be introduced in May 2012 so we've really got about a year to try to show them that the scheme we've set up in UK PAC works and to try and persuade them that what they need to do is embrace that with a statutory hug rather than mm. invent yeah, something yes. else we have a comment here uh, via Twitter from an at Dimac. I am for regulation to bolster reputation for professionalism. So some support coming through on Twitter there. And it, and it seems to me that um, I was listening to Today programme yesterday morning and uh, McNaughty was interviewing people f from different sides of the argument about the minimum price on alcohol. Okay. And one of the people being interviewed introduced the term, well, you're just you know, part of the lobby. 
And James McNaughty jumped in at that point and said, oh, hang on a minute, let's not go there. As if someone had just thrown an insult around. Mm. Where do you see the reputation of your profession at the moment, Keith? Well, it is a bit like that. I mean, some people find the word lobbyist around as a kind of insult kind of thing. But, it, but it, what changes things with UK, with UK PAC and with having a statutory register is it will be revealed to everyone who lobbyists are. And it, it's whether they're, uh, they're in trade unions, whether they're in, they're in charities... Uh, whether they're in consultancies, whether they're, they're in-house. The point is that the, the definition that we are using covers the activity of lobbying, not whether you like that particular lobbying or not. There is, that, that is irrelevant. It's whoever is trying to influence government. And it will become clear to everyone who a lobbyist is. And it will also become clear to everyone which lobbyists are regulated and which aren't. So we feel that this will bolster the reputation of those lobbyists, clearly the ro lobbyists that are regulated. Just come back to the come back to the uh, the, the register itself it goes live mid February. Well, we hope early February, but we, right. we we don't want to promise anything. We want everybody to be in there signed up by the end of January. We've just then got to check the accuracy of the information to make sure we haven't got any technical glitches. As soon as we've done that, press release launch, people can look at it. It's going live on the web. It'll go live on and, the web. Presumably, journalists are hanging in there waiting to. We expect so. As they do with these things, yeah. interrogate that data. And people can look at the website now. There's some basic information on the website, and that's the same place they'll. And they can sign up there. I mean, that's where CIPR yeah, members should be going. You can either sign up there as a CIPR member at the moment, or if you're not a CIPR member, clearly you can join the CIPR and, and join the register through that. And that's route. a good pitch. And just to clarify, the URL is publicaffairscouncil.org.uk. Got a question in from Claire. Should PR marketing professionals sign up on the UK PAC register? And she has a specific clarification that she's seeking. Whilst not a lobbyist in the traditional sense, uh, Claire and her colleagues do communicate messages for clients via a full range of on and offline marketing channels. And I guess the inference is there that ultimately civil servants and politicians are reading the output, uh, being influenced by the output of her campaigns. Does that qualifier under that definition? Oh, so individual cases, I don't know the, the exact detail of that, but clearly she's got to look at the, the definition, uh, decide if she's doing the kind of work that influences uh, government uh, directly or indirectly t more than 20% of the time, then uh, she needs to take a view on that and, and register if, if she does. And there is another issue there. I don't know what sort of firm she's working for, but it's possible that the firm she's working for may be a member, and this is not CIPR, but a member of one of the other bodies which takes corporate membership, in which case she'd be listed within that. So there are different ways of this. At the end of the day, we would like to see as many people being transparent about this as possible. While it's a voluntary scheme, the route in is through membership of one of the three bodies. We don't know what the criteria will be when it becomes a statutory scheme, but at the moment the route in is through the three who've actually taken the step forward and they need praise for this I think the three mm -hmm. bodies have been willing to work together uh, you know inside the room working for the interests of the profession um, to try to ensure that together they can show that the standards of the profession uh, are taken seriously. So there's more support can be through uh, Timothy Wakefield says I'm happy with lobbying and uh, the, the, the level of transparency and this is all about transparency in the industry growing up isn't it? It is. Transparency in, in, in two respects. It's one about who the lobbyists are, being completely clear about who, who lobbyists are, wh wherever they are and whoever they, they work for, and both being completely clear about who they represent quite publicly. So you'll find in the register details of who lobbyists are and you'll find details of who their clients are too. And I think we would say, though, as UKPAC, that transparency is not an end in itself. We think it has to go that bit further. Now, the government's commitment in its manifesto was simply to a statutory register. UKPAC says we don't want you on our register unless you also sign up to a code of practice. Now, that's something we'll have to debate with government to see what happens uh, after 2012. But for the moment, we're quite clear that transparency is important, very important, but it's not on its own enough. You have to be willing to say that you'll, you'll sign up to some serious mm -hmm. standards. So, so Peter Walker, another comment that's come through here says, um, you know, we're not making this mandatory, as is the case with many other um, profession, you know, traditional professions. Why is that not the case? Well, why don't you mandate that? CIPR members in order to be... Well, all, all CIPR, we are mandating. You are, as, okay. as, a, as, a, as an element of your membership of CIPR, if you meet that definition, 
then you will have to register with the UK PAC. So we are making it mandatory. Obviously, the government are also committed. In fact, all three parties are committed mm. to making it uh, mandatory, and there will be a statutory register come uh, 2012. So just to clarify then, uh, there's 10,000 odd CIPR members. Yes, certainly are. How many do we estimate... I would estimate would fall under the definition if you had to give it a ballpark. I would say something between six and seven hundred. I would say would meet the definition of, of lobbyist. And the question continues: Could you tell me who over the age of sixteen will not be required to register? <laughs> if that is an unreasonable question, then what about every professional from architect to teacher and social worker? It's quite an interesting comment on on the way we behave in Britain. It's the same with journalists. We don't have a definition like some countries, I think Italy, have of a, a journalist. Anybody can be a journalist, and here anybody can be. I'm sure I lobby on my own behalf in on lots of occasions, whether it's you know on a private basis or with my local MP or council or whatever. We go back to Keith's definition: it's paid for, profession. professional, mm. and a significant part of your work. Okay. Well, we have more. Questions coming through via Twitter. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder once again, if you want to participate in the conversation going on as we're live on air, it's hash CIPR TV. Of course, if you are watching this on demand, the conversation might be a bit, a bit quieter <laughs> right now. Uh, so so, um, so we, we, we've talked about the, the relationship with the government. Is there any early indication of, of how this is likely to be received? Um, only uh, an indication in, in the sense that we know what government generally is doing. I would be very shocked if they wanted to create a new non-departmental body to do this work, mm. Mm. which is why I'm as confident as I can be that if UKPAC can show that it can do the job, they'll be happy for us to do that on their behalf within a statutory framework. Right. So I'm just I'm just extrapolating from what they've done elsewhere. I, you know, that th you know I, I'm in a world where I'm looking at, at the Public Bodies Act to see which schedule I'm in wearing other hats. Mm. I'd be very surprised if they wanted to add to that list if there's somebody who can do it in a different way. So I'm as confident as I can be that if we do this well, and I'm determined we will do it well, that we can persuade ministers that we can deliver on their objectives with whatever amendments they want us to make. They might want some, we like our definition, but we might have to negotiate what the final definition would be. We like our requirement that it should be a sign up to some sort of code of practice. We might have mm -hmm. to discuss that. But at the heart of it, I hope we'll be able to persuade them that we can deliver. So, so, the, so yeah, so we just had an interesting question here that's trying to scope how far we might go here. In as much as we'll end up with a registry where anybody can access it, any member of the public, and find out whether John Smith is paid by X, Y, or Z to lobby on their behalf. That's right. And uh, do we have to disclose who they're interacting with? Do we need, in the words of Dr. Russell Jackson at Sheffield Hallam University, do, do we think we're going to end up at full financial disclosure? Not in our voluntary scheme. We've been quite clear that we think that isn't required. Clearly these things have to be evidence-based. If we find that we've done all this and there are still problems, we mm. might have to revisit it. But the mm. view, of the stand of UK PAC is no. Okay. Uh, people might want to take a different view in mm. responding to the government because the government will ask those questions, I'm sure, in its consultation. But we're saying, yes, a list of clients, but no, not, no financial information. Mm. Question from Natalie, how do you expect the media to react to this? That's incredible, because we, we've, we've seen how the media loves crawling through data sets on, online, you know. Wikipedia, well, I'm, no uh, I'm, not, I'm not a media specialist. Wikileaks is one, ex to be. one uh, extreme. But I, I, I would expect they would welcome, um, I think people will be surprised how many people are lobbyists. So I think, that, I think they will welcome uh, that kind of transparency about who, who does what. Um, I think they'll also welcome um, the fact that we will be able to demonstrate who is a regulated lobbyist ultimately in the statutory regime and who isn't. And I think that, that those, that's very interesting information for a, for a journalist. I, I, if, if I was not regulated at the moment, I'd be getting a little bit of cold feet and thinking, I need to get on this, this volunteer You have signed up yourself, Keith. Right? I have indeed, yes. <laughs> at least to say I have. We should, okay, I mean, it's worth, can we repeat how, as a, a, a CIPR member, I, I sign up to the register? Yes, uh, well, either you, uh, well, you go to the, to, to the website and, and complete your details. It should be reasonably intuitive about that website about address. And the website address, again, is well, www.publicaffairscouncil.org.uk. But we have some criticism coming in from Ooh, Steve Bryson, right. who feels that the UK PAC needlessly made the registration process so difficult and time consuming. 
It is essentially just a simple list containing our names, our agencies and our clients, but the process is absolutely tedious! Exclamation mark. Can you make this online process more intuitive? Well, what I'd like to invite him to do is send us specifically an email and, and uh, we will have a look to see what his problem's been. Keith's been and done it himself. I don't think you found it too difficult. No, 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 I didn't. Um, we did so. have. If he was one of the early people to register, he may mm. have had some problems. Ah, okay. uh, if he was very good and, and, and came to us while we were still in sort of uh, testing phase where we hadn't got rid of all the technical glitches, we certainly have streamlined it since we first mm. launched yep. it. Mm -hmm. um, and it may, I hope that's the answer because we've spent sure, a lot sure. of time trying to make it as simple as we can. If we haven't, let us know. Let us know specifically what the problems are uh, and we'll, we'll try and uh, so, improve so the Steve, process. Uh, and anybody else, of course, who'd like to get in touch with these guys, you can email info at publicaffairscouncil.org.uk and it's on your screen right now. Oh, we're just coming to the end right now. Um, would you believe it? 20 minutes is almost upon right, us. Bye. I just wondered if you'd like to give us any of your final thoughts on any aspect of, of the topic of conversation here that we might not have, have covered so far. I think just a little bit of a plug. And if you join mm -hmm. the CIPR now, you can get uh, 15 months for the price of 12. <laughs> oh, okay, off public affairs and suddenly onto CIPR membership. What well, a great you, time you to can join. Join the register through the CIPR and get 15 months or 12. So. And just Thanks, to balance Keith. that, to make sure that we know that this is our aim is to make sure that as many people as possible on that register, whichever mm. route in they take, so that we can actually demonstrate this high level of uh, concern about ethical standards. I'd like to thank Elizabeth and Keith again for taking the time to be with us today and lending us their insight into some of the most important changes in recent times to the way we interact with government. And remember, this show will be available to play on demand by tomorrow morning if you think your colleagues or peers might benefit from watching it. Just pop over to CIPR.tv. And we're not off air for long. Join us on the 2nd of February at the usual time of 5 o'clock. And for now, goodbye.